السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته وعليكم السلام ورحمه الله وبركاته How are you? Happy with you. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Alhamdulillah. I hope you had a blessed uh, Islamic New Year, inshallah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful, I would like to welcome all of you on uh, this uh, class at uh, this class number six on Friday, twenty-one July, two thousand twenty-three. Uh, Jum'a Mubaraka, a blessed Friday to everybody. Uh, this is ITKI six two zero three. Islam and Family Institutions, and it is the summer trimester, June through August 2023 for the IKI Academy, and I am your instructor, Dr. Omar Al-Talib. Uh, I am happy to be here with you in a mutual learning experience uh, and a chance to share our ideas with each other, our questions with each other, and our concerns and criticisms uh, and uh, challenges with each other. Uh, mentioning that this is class number six, as you know, we have a total of 12 class sessions. So this being the sixth, meaning we have accomplished, uh, we have completed uh, already uh, half of our trimester. So congratulations to all of you who have been with us during this whole time. Uh, and we have one half left of the trimester. So uh, time is moving quickly, uh, thanks to our creator. Uh, and I was very happy uh, for those of you who sent me assignment number one. Uh, and uh, I am thankful uh, for your submission. Uh, and it will count to your, toward your final grade. Uh, and we look forward, inshallah, when I will be giving you uh, the three remaining assignments and the uh, paper uh, assignment, the research paper that will be worth 50% of your marks for this course. Uh, as always, I am happy to hear your questions and thoughts uh, and concerns. 
uh, about anything we are discussing in this class uh, and any matters and any issues uh, that are going, are going on in your life as they relate to any of our uh, class discussions or uh, the themes uh, that we are speaking about. Uh, one of the themes uh, that runs throughout uh, issues regarding the family is uh, building character, uh, instilling morality, teaching values uh, to the next generation, to our children. Uh, as you know, every successful civilization uh, is based upon uh, a set of uh, morals and values. Uh, and so these uh, morals and values uh, underpin uh, the uh, basis of uh, every uh, civilization uh, known to uh, humanity, known to mankind. Uh, <clears throat> at the same time, it is very difficult to teach morality and values uh, and character. Uh, we can talk about the importance of honesty, we can talk about the importance of courage, we can talk about uh, the importance of integrity, we can talk about uh, the importance of thrift, we can talk about uh, the importance of humility, we can talk about uh, the importance of uh, <coughs> uh, service to uh, the elders, we can talk about the importance of respect of the elders, all these and many other uh, character traits, values, uh, moral principles uh, are important. Uh, but being, uh, they're having importance as one thing, instilling them in the children is a different thing. Uh, so uh, no matter how important we think something is, uh, just talking about it is not going to uh, lead us to uh, our goal. Uh, it's uh, passing it on and making sure that there is a continuity of these values in the next generation and the generation after that, uh, and so on. And one of the challenges that faced the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is uh, the Quran was revealed through him. Uh, the Quran contains uh, a huge set of values and morals and beliefs, uh, and he tried everything he could to instill these values, moral, mor morals and beliefs uh, into his companions, into his followers, uh, and then they would try to spread it to others, uh, and then you had the uh, generation after the companions. But as time passed, Sometimes these uh, values uh, and uh, character traits uh, are uh, going to uh, be sustainable uh, and continue from one uh, generation to another. So there is a continuity or increase. And sometimes there's the opposite. They start to decline. Uh, they start to get lost. Uh, they start to be forgotten they start to weaken. And this is what the great uh, Islamic sociologist Ibn Khaldun talked about uh, many hundreds of years ago. He said, civilizations begin weak and poor and unimportant, and then uh, they have a rise, uh, and that is when uh, they become strong in morality, strong in uh, their uh, military, strong in their government, strong in their economy, uh, strong in their families and society, and then they reach a peak, and then you start to see the corruption, the disease, the weakening, the loss of the strengths that help them to rise, so then they slowly or quickly uh, decline. <clears throat> it's true of every civilization on earth. This is one of the uh, rules of God on earth. Civilizations rise, and then they fall. And then another civilization rises up, uh, and it falls throughout human history, from the beginning of humanity till the end of humanity. So the challenge is, at the family level, continuing these moral values and beliefs, and at the social level and at the civilizational level, keeping these morals and values and beliefs.
very hard, very expensive, very time consuming, but very essential for every single family, society, and civilization. So where do we stand? What can we do? What are the principles uh, that we can uh, take into account uh, so that uh, what we want to accomplish is properly uh, accomplished? Uh, this is not easy. Uh, this is not uh, always possible. Uh, and this is not always uh, something uh, that uh, we may be uh, well trained to do. So it's just like water. You see, uh, I have a bottle of water here. Okay. And as I am giving my uh, talk, my lecture, I am drinking water. Our body needs water, our body needs nourishment. And this nourishment has to be continuous uh, and has to be repeated all the time throughout the day when we are awake. We say Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim in the name of our Lord, the Beneficent, the Merciful, before we begin. And then after we end, we say Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Thanks to uh, the uh, Lord of the Worlds. So this water, which uh, we know from science and medicine and uh, uh, nutrition studies, uh, that uh, if you neglect it, if you don't put enough, and if you don't do it consistently, your body will suffer. So without making uh, comparisons uh, in, that uh, may uh, be misunderstood, one of the ways to understand the importance of values and character traits in every civilization is, is to compare it to the importance of water. They have to be there. They have to be instilled. They have to be uh, in the right place at the right time, uh, continuously uh, provided. So if you look at Islamic civilization, when it was at its best, uh, over a thousand years ago, you saw water everywhere. Muslims had places for drinking water in the street. Uh, Islamic civilization had uh, places for ablution in the mosques. Uh, Muslims had fountains of water throughout their cities and towns. Uh, Muslims uh, made sure that uh, they took advantage of the rivers and streams uh, and lakes uh, and uh, oceans and seas where their uh, cities uh, are frequently located. Uh, and Muslims made sure uh, that the contact with water was constant, that our bodies continuously got this important resource. And some people say, well, when I'm thirsty, I drink. That's actually uh, problematic. You should drink enough and consistently and to such an extent so that you don't even get to feel thirsty. When you feel thirsty, it's like your body giving you a warning that it's too late. You uh, did not give the body enough, so uh, this is not good. And uh, please, uh, you've, you've waited until it became an emergency. So always drink enough water consistently so that you never actually feel thirsty because you've already given your body enough. So what I'm emphasizing here is, it sounds simple, but it's extremely hard. Continuously nourish your children, continuously provide your children, continuously inject into your children all the values and morals and beliefs that are going to help them become successful in this life and the hereafter so that they are continuously prepared uh, and nourished for their spirit and their soul and for uh, their body and for uh, their lives and this is an essential element of all civilizations the character the values the morals uh, the beliefs what happens when there is a breakdown in values and morals and beliefs? 
uh, well, you get uh, lying, stealing, cheating, uh, raping, killing, murdering, hurting, torturing. Uh, you get the worst behaviors of humans against humans and humans against animals and humans against the environment uh, and humans against uh, this earth that sustains them. So you get corruption. And there is a verse in the Quran about corruption in the land and uh, the seas. So uh, how do you corrupt the land? You destroy the forests, you kill the animals, uh, you uh, throw pollution into the rivers. Every single country on earth is polluting the earth. Every single society on earth is polluting the earth in massive quantities billions of tons of trash are thrown into our rivers and oceans uh, and uh, massive amounts of the forests and jungles are being cut down every day uh, and destroyed and these cannot be uh, <coughs> renewed it takes these forests took thousands and, and hundreds of thousands and millions of years to develop uh, and we are uh, in uh, the worst possible way, uh, destroying them. So this is a sign of corruption. This is a sign of immorality. This is a sign of uh, absence of characters, absence of uh, the right values, absence of the right beliefs. So a child has to uh, love their creator, ought to love their creator, and at the same time love themselves. A breakdown in the relationship with the Creator will lead to hatred and dislike and getting away from uh, the uh, great teachings of the Qur'an and, and the holy books. A breakdown in the relationship with yourself, if you don't love yourself, you can end up hating yourself. And that can show up as depression, it can show up as suicide, it can so show up as loneliness. Uh, it can show up as social isolation. So this is where we have to be very careful, especially with our kids. If our kids are happy, healthy, social, interested in learning, interested in uh, serving uh, their elders, interested in taking care of their family, interested in uh, making the world a better place, this is uh, considered uh, positive and healthy and uh, a good uh, set of circumstances and uh, a, a worthy goal. However, if our children are depressed or lonely or suicidal or antisocial or unwilling to be uh, of good character and uh, be of uh, help to uh, themselves and others, then this is a sign of some kind of disease, some kind of uh, mental issue, some kind of uh, social breakdown. There could be a lot of reasons for it. And our job as parents is to look out for it and to work on preventing it and also to work on resolving it. Now, how, when, where, and why would a parent do that? One way a parent can uh, establish a healthy situation for their children is to connect the children to the family and to nature. So how do you connect the child to their family? You teach them from a very young age to be productive, to serve, to contribute. What might that look like? So from a very young age, children can learn to be clean and to clean things up. Children can learn to be uh, <clears throat> uh, able to wash clothes. They can learn to pick up trash. They can learn to arrange their toys and their clothes and their bed. They can learn to start cooking. They can learn to uh, help the parent no matter what the parent is doing while at the same time making sure they do not get hurt 
uh, and they do not uh, injure themselves. Now, what a lot of parents do, and I'm not saying anything about their intention, but what a lot of parents do is they never teach their children how to cook. They never teach their children how to clean the house. They never uh, teach their children how to make their environment better. Their attitude may be, among many attitudes, let them play, let them have fun, let them uh, enjoy themselves, let them study, uh, all kinds of excuses, as if they are doing their kids a favor or their upbringing is uh, therefore better. Now, this is very problematic uh, because when we say that uh, we need to let children have fun and to play and to enjoy their life, that's good. But what children need to learn is that cooking is fun, cleaning is fun, helping your parents is fun. It is part of being happy. It is part of enjoying life. It is part of play. Let me repeat this so that it is very clear. Rather than making a distinction between having fun and playing and enjoying themselves and engaging in productive activities on the other side, we combine the two. Productivity is a value that should be taught to every child as something fun and good and nice and worthy of reward. So we combine service to parents, cleaning the house, being helpful, cooking, cleaning, uh, washing the dishes, I mean, or washing the clothes, taking care of the yard uh, outside the house, welcoming guests. All this is essential to be instilled in children as part of their happiness and fulfillment and having fun and playing. And this is for all ages. So what some parents do, again, I'm not criticizing the parent in terms of their intention, but what I'm saying is what some parents do, let's say you have guests coming. Rather than the child greeting the guests at the door, opening the door, welcoming the guests, the parents do it. Rather than the child serving the guests tea or uh, food or uh, putting uh, the plate on the table, the parents do it. Or if they are wealthy or have more money, usually servants might do it. This is problematic. Teach the children to do it. If you teach them from an early age, they will enjoy it and they will consider it as a productive activity because you will tell them that. And it for them, it will be a sense of fulfillment. They are making themselves and their parents happy. They are being good children. They are becoming a part of society that is valued and that is nurtured and that is rewarded. Children should never be rewarded for laziness and inactivity. Thank you, Brother Abdul Hamid. Uh, you are absolutely correct that what is happening uh, in terms of upbringing uh, when children are not taught uh, the value of service is it is causing lots of deterioration, uh, especially in terms of manners. You are absolutely correct. Uh, can you give us some examples of that? Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum as salam. Um, thank you very much, uh, Doctor. You, I've been saying a lot, so I, which is just the fact. Because uh, an example is uh, in my own locality where I stay. Yeah, you see children, grown up children, like let me say, like ten years old. They would not even greet the elders, or even when somebody comes to their home. They they run away as if the person is a, is a is like 
a monster or somebody that wants to come and kidnap them or something like that. And again, when you meet them outside, they, you, they pass by the elders without even greeting them. So, which is causing a lot of issues, whereby since they are not, they don't have a good manner to even greet an elder, how will that person talk to them in case if they are doing something wrong? And which this comes from their home because from their home, even their parents have not rebooked, uh, rebooked them or revoked them from doing the right thing. So outsider cannot even talk to them or probably put them to, to order. So that is a, what I part of the situation here. Uh, may Allah bless you. Uh, yes, uh, so uh, you have uh, really uh, identified a key issue. Uh, Abdul Hamid, uh, and this is uh, relationships, uh, communication, contact, the importance of greeting and acknowledging uh, and accepting. So, if I ask uh, Bibijan or Saudat or uh, Ahmed Khalil, how were you taught to behave towards the elders? Let's say in terms of greeting, what are some of the things that you have been taught? Okay, maybe I'll start. Salam alaikum. Alaikum salam. Uh, <clears throat> well, I'm a baby boomers generation. So um, my parents are illiterate. They don't have education. They can't read ABC or Alibata. But uh, even without education, Alhamdulillah, I'm so blessed. We were brought up in a very good way. We were we were we were taught about what is adab, uh, what is akhlaq, and what is moral values. Um, we we don't we 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 have to call our family members, especially among the elders, according to the hierarchy. Unlike now, they can just call anyone, and they can call their parents their own name. But in the past. We have to call our uncle, our aunties, both side maternal, paternal side in different way. We have to recognize, we have to appropriate way of addressing them. So even if we were to walk in front of them, we have to bend our body. We just can walk straight, you know. So even if we want to point anything, we have to point using our our thumb. We just can pointing using our 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 um, fingers. So these are the things that simple, simple, very, very minute thing we were taught. Um, our parents, um, they, 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 they were not working at that time. Even if they were working, we have our other elderly that also keep an eye on us. Our aunties, our uncles. I think now with the, I mean, for me, I see the changes in, in especially in country like Singapore over the years from 1950s up to the year now, 70 years, I find that um, the, the, the whole uh, society landscape uh, have changed the values. We're not just talking about erosion of values. I'm talking about really absence of the values. Uh, then they're trying to bring back the value in school, uh, which I find that sometimes um, is value is not just being taught, value is being caught. You know, you, you have to you have, people have to see the value in action. It's very difficult to tell to the child in the classroom setting that, you know, you have to do this, you have to do that. But in reality, we don't see it being manifested. So again, the whole process of socialization in the past and now is very different. So we are not actually focusing on the Fardu Ain. We are more focusing on the Fardu Kifaya. I'm talking about my situation in Singapore. Well, Muslim parents, just like in any way, we have the whole continuum of Muslim parents. We have one extreme who is just focusing on religious, on value, on rituals, and ignoring the other part they don't want the children to go to. Mainstream school, they prefer to educate themselves, homeschooling, blah, blah, blah. And we, we, we want them to be, they want the child to be in the Pesantren or the Islamic Madrasa school where they feel that the child will be protected, insulated, you know, against all these so-called evil, secular values. 
And we have also the other extreme of our Muslim parents who believe that the only way to get good school, if you cannot send to madrasa, because madrasa is also not foolproof, but they send to Christian mission school, minus uh, adopting the mission, the Christian um, practices, but they know that the Christian uh, actually um, focus on value rather than normal government school or government aided school. So there are a lot of diversity in the practice of the whether Muslim or not Muslim. So the whole spectrum can be seen, whether even in the other extreme, both sides of the pole, I find that um, this is where being Muslim, I, I believe that Alhamdulillah is, is very important to have a very proper tasawur, proper uh, understanding of Islam, proper perspective of Islam, so that our children will grow up in a very Islamic way. So even though they are living in the contemporary, modern, plural, uh, secularism, whatever ism, Alhamdulillah, they are very grounded, they are very centered because we make sure that they are Allah-centric, they have high level of Islamic consciousness. I think that itself, we leave it to Allah to guide them, to 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 to, to, to guide them and to guide them and to protect them. Allah Allah. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you for that uh, contribution, uh, Bibi John. Uh, so that what were you taught uh, on how to treat uh, and greet elders? For example, in my in my family, because I'm a mix of Pakistani and Turkish, and my my father, my my dad, my mother is of Indian Gujaratis and 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 Chinese, and they were brought up in the Malay community. So the Malay family adopted my grandmother, who is a Chinese, and brought up in a Malay traditional way. So when my grandmother passed away, six days after she gave birth to my mother, my grandfather married to a Javanese. So you can just imagine the kind of value that I have. I'm exposed to all kind of values. So for example, we have to call our grandparents from our paternal side, Daddy and Dada, Chachi and Chacha, and from our mother's side, Mommy and Mama, and everything else. And of course, we have the Malay version as well. So you find that we have to follow, we have to observe all these. But now our children don't don't use all these, don't use all these uh, terminologies, which is peculiar to the culture of each group. So now everything auntie auntie, everybody is auntie auntie uncle uncle. It's a generic term for anybody. So uh, even in the Malay community, for example, you have if you if you if you if you you're, you're the eldest of the family, you are known as the Sulong. Sulong is Pak Long. Pak Long means you are the eldest. And then, of course, Tengah is Tengah and younger and all that. So they've got hierarchy. So you just cannot call them just auntie and uncle, but um, the, uh, big uncle, big auntie, middle uncle, middle auntie. So you have to go to that level. Uh, so this is something that I observe nowadays. Nobody bother to to address their, their elderly this way. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, really uh, a matter of concern and uh, serious issue. Uh, so that, uh, what uh, kinds of uh, things were you taught uh, growing up regarding uh, treating elders? So, uh, as, I mean, we, Alhamdulillah, we treat treating our elderly um, is part of our 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 Islamic tradition. They, we I was always told that in any home, uh, the, when you have homes that you have elderly and you have children, the the the, the angels of Rama will always come and bless the home. So to us, we grew up in a very standard family system. We don't have a luxury of privacy, one child, one room, or, or one couple, one room. We all have one, two bedrooms and 10, 12 people, 15 people stay together. So that's how we, we grew up, that sardine pack of kind of family. So, uh, but Alhamdulillah, even with sardine pack, boundaries are very clearly established, you know. So you can even raise the way my mother used to teach me, the way you talk to your elderly will be different from the way you talk to your sibling. 
So these are all important things, simple communication. I just wonder now with the latest uh, effective communication skills enrichment program come brought, uh, introduced in school and even some parents are sending their children to, to etiquette school and all that. But I think again, children are not just being taught. You have, you have to you have to you have to apply it. You have to see it. You have to you have to operationalizing it. Then it become um, part and parcel of your life. Otherwise, it will just uh, it will just be lip service. I, I I feel that. I mean, even for me, I, I even myself. I'm talking about myself now. Um, I have I'm taking care of my elderly at home, and I've got I've got six kids. And my 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 daughter, one of my daughters, um, they receive education in Australia, and they stayed there for twenty over years. And she told me, "Mummy, in Australia, why are you putting your father here at home? <coughs> Do you think she's he is best taken care by? We have all the money in the world to pay the best elder care or whatever for for him." I said, "Look." Yes, you may have doctors 24 hours, you may have nurses 24 hours, you have everything. But at this time of her life, it's like he needs someone, his family, when he opens his eyes in his family. So this you, you can see how the, the child sees that uh, the elderly in, in the Western world, they are very independent. Unlike the elderly in, the, in, in your community, mommy, where they, they expect the children to take care. I said, look, you cannot compare. Because a child, a 14-year-old child, 10-year-old child, in, in, in the Western world, they are, they're already independent. They leave their home. They can stay in their friend's house. In our family, we, we don't allow you to leave our house until you get married, until you move to your husband's house. That's how we, we, we are taught. So it's, it's different. It's a different value. But again, this value changes. It's very much related to generational intergenerational characteristic and traits so it's intertwined with the whole thing so we cannot have a blank check that actually oh because they are of different generation therefore they have different value yes agree but this is where we being elderly and having good islamic uh, understanding knowledge and all that uh, we have to teach them the right value yeah thank you uh bb john uh so that can you hear us? Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum salam. Naam. Yes. When it comes to. Go ahead. Salam alaikum. Alaikum salam. Now, hope you can hear me very well now. Yes. Okay. When it comes to child upbringing, or let me say the how to how the children how to respect the elderly person, I have to rely. I believe Islam teaches us everything. So the more we understand Islam, the better we become in terms of uh, akhlaq, uh, moral, and everything generally. So I'm I'm uh, I'm very fortunate to be to to be one of the daughter of scholars in my community. Uh, so they taught us everything about Islam. When we, when we are trying to talk about the respect to the elders. In fact, they let us know that if elderly, if is the is the right for us to greet elderly person first. Don't wait for elderly person to say assalamu alaikum to you before you greet. You must greet them first. And if they carry something, you must collect it.
full respect to them. And when they are talking, you shouldn't our daddy's grandchildren. So we let them know that in our community, we must, because we have name and we must maintain it in terms of good things. So don't misbehave, so do not spoil the names we have already built. So when it comes to respect, we, we do give them as they want, inshallah. So, wallah, Allah. May Allah bless you uh, so that uh, thank you for sharing these very important insights. Uh, Ahmed Khalil. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you, uh, thank you uh, doctor, uh, for uh, giving me the time. Yeah, uh, in our side uh, here, I also uh, belong to uh, the same uh, uh, nation from where uh, Miss Bibi Jan is, that is uh, Pakistan. And uh, some of that, uh, uh, the traditions uh, uh, match uh, with what uh, she has said. So, of course, Alhamdulillah, uh, we are being brought up uh, here uh with uh, with very purpose of uh, akhlaq and akhlaq -e hasana and uh, uh, we are uh, being taught to of uh, respect to elders and uh, love to the children and uh, then uh, 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 it is very clear uh, uh, the prophet sallallahu has uh, uh, what uh, he has taught us uh, uh, the dua is rabbil hamhuma kama rabbayani saghira uh, so the, uh, that uh, uh, we should uh, pay for our parents that how they have treated us, uh, Allah Almighty treat to them. So uh, uh, and that uh, teachings of uh, 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 Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and uh, what we have uh, uh, learned from uh, Sahaba uh, that there there are very clear teachings of uh, respect to uh, elders and uh, there is a uh, verses of surah bani israel uh, where uh, uh, it is very clear that uh, we how well, it is very clearly even uh, taught that how we should uh, uh, communicate with our uh, parents so uh, and the same goes for uh, uh, that uh, uh, hadith of nabi sallallahu where a sahaba uh, uh, come and uh, ask uh, uh, who is uh, uh, the point of point person to, uh, so our, my love goes uh, in this world na? and uh, uh, prophet sallallahu repeated uh, this uh, thrice that your mother is that person who should uh, you love and then uh, he uh, the uh, fourth time or probably the third time he asked for his father that uh, you should love him so all these uh, uh, kind of uh, I shouldn't uh, go in the details because all of uh, us uh, uh, here um, I actually know better than me. So uh, I was just recalling that uh, that uh, it is very clear in all these uh, examples that uh, it sh how it should be done. And uh, with respect to uh, so Alhamdulillah, uh, the, uh, our religion is very clear about uh, how we should treat. And then uh, if we uh, talk about our tradition here. Uh, it uh, uh, it is very clearly uh, objectified by uh, my uh, my predecessor, my, what I am from, that uh, my previous two uh, scholars, that uh, these uh, uh, our traditions are very clear about uh, how uh, we should treat. Uh, so, but uh, the modern uh, things have uh, quite, uh, changed quite a bit. So, uh, our, one, uh, one of our point uh, in here has said in Urdu actually that uh, uh, the more we are going towards the, the modernism or the knowledge, the more we are lacking the moral values. Right? I don't know uh, why it is. Actually, it is, uh, uh, we can say that it is the, it is the capitalist world which we are living in. Uh, it's my own point that uh, you should guide us uh, how uh, it is so uh, it's um, uh, we i can say that in the material world uh, all around us so the, our values are uh, changing gradually but uh, if we uh, look at uh, our uh, elder times when we were in childhood or if we uh, move towards from urban slums to uh, urban areas towards uh, the rural areas there is uh, a much uh, uh, 
uh, uh, prevalence of uh, respect of elders and the, uh, I, it is just what i think no so these were my points uh, actually i've taken quite a lot of time <laughs> thank you uh, thank you very much uh, ahmed khalil and i'm very glad you shared many important aspects of uh, muslim culture in pakistan uh, anas Brother Anas Padikal. Hello. Salam. Uh, okay, I would like to present a Muslim family issues here and like this uh, of you. Okay. So during the last hundred years, Canadian changes have taken uh, taken place in the Indian family system. Changes in the traditional family system have been so enormous that the joint family system was once uh, the characteristic feature of the Indian society. This is steadily on the when uh, from the urban scene. In rural areas, it is arriving in its nominal form as a kinship group only. Now the nuclear family has become uh, the characteristic features of the Indian society. Changes uh, in the family system have uh, given rise to various new problems and uh, uh, men's fields and of the old ones. Which have has uh, always been sensitive to the problems of family. Uh, it is apparent from a uh, variety of legislations uh, local and implemented by the government of India as well as the state government by the government of India uh, as well as, as well as the state government as and when necessitated. In particular, the government of India has taken several useful legislative measures relating to widow remarriage, uh, women's right to property, uh, the practice of child marriage, uh, child labor, uh, adoption and uh, maintenance, dowry, family courts, uh, dissolution of marriage, affecting different communities, and the most recently domestic uh, violence, which have uh, impacted the Indian family system in more ways uh, than one. For the formulation of a single national policy, uh, considering the large size and the uh, uh, heterogeneity of a society like that of India is really a difficult task. Barriers to the creation of comprehensive national policy in India are uh, indicated by Indian authority. Uh, it also proves that the state does not have uh, enough political will to do support uh, some political aspirancy. Uh, families in India are undergo, undergoing vast changes like increasing uh, rights, domestic violence, in their uh, generational uh, conflicts, social problems of drug abuse, uh, joinal, uh, These changes indicate the inability to cope with uh, the procession of modern life, yet the majority seem to have survived and are able to modify and adapt to changing social norms, values, and structures, and uh, have demonstrated a unique strength in keeping together despite the growth and strain. In recent decades, family studies have undergone several developments. Family studies in India are viewed within the uh, institutional framework of particular society. In each society, families vary in their of adjustment to accept norms owing to the family interaction pattern and external forces. They are present that uh, is uh, like to be committed in it. And similar to this, to, and to this.
solve these problems. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Anas. Uh, we really appreciate your contribution to this uh, discussion in our class about upbringing and how uh, children are taught to respect their parents. Uh, Sanjar, uh, what can you share about how you were taught, uh, what you were taught uh, on how to respect uh, elders uh, and parents? Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum salam. Uh, the family upbringing uh, in Uzbekistan. Uh, we have uh, uh, many issues uh, as uh, Muslim Muslims have throughout the world, but there is a, a little bit difference between uh, Uzbek Muslims and other uh, Muslims in other part of the world. Because uh, here uh, in Uzbekistan, yeah, uh, you know, uh, very secularized and uh, experienced atheism. And after this, uh, we uh, were uh, undergoing, have been undergoing a transformation in value system. Yeah, we cannot say that uh, culturally, uh, the or Uzbek society is not homogeneous, is it different. Uh, because some part of popula uh, people population uh, uh, oriented at Islamic uh, values, some of them the Russian European values, uh, not liberal, because there are also uh, some kind of uh, conservative uh, regarding the uh, 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 upbringing children upbringing, children raising, and when it comes to the uh, respect for elders, yeah, still we have such a tradition or value, we support this, among, but as the younger generations, uh, it, it's, uh, it's uh, very, very, um, I would say, uh, related to the big cities, because, you know, uh, big cities, and uh, their uh, cultural ties, uh, the values uh, are very weak among the young children. And but in rural areas, uh, more conservative, and uh, use uh, respect not their uh, uh, their parts, but also elders in every area. Uh, mm, what? What to say? No, I think after 10 or 20 years later, <laughs> uh, this value will be uh, abolished or what, what's the destructed. I don't know, but this is a tendency because family institution is changing. The values is, uh, uh, is changing. In, in our society today because of the globalization and uh, uh, the uh, liberalization uh, and uh, at that uh, state policy, homophobic, homophobic policy. Uh, this uh, is obstructing the family values, especially traditional values regarding the family, regarding the elder, uh, elders. Thank you very much. Jazakallah khair. Uh, thank you all of you for your contributions uh, to this uh, uh, discussion, uh, to the sharing of uh, different uh, types of uh, habits and uh, behaviors that can be instilled in children to show respect for elders. So in my generation, for example, uh, we never call uh, our elder by uh, their first name. We never say, like my mom, her name is Ilham. I would never call her Ilham. My dad, his name is Hisham. I would never address him as Hisham. I would say mother or father. 
or if it is my uncle or aunt or other elder person, I would call them uh, as a teacher or professor or uh, sheikh or mister or missus. And uh, there is a way that children were taught to greet elders. One way is you shake their hand and you kiss their hand and you kiss their uh, head uh, and uh, you uh, show respect by bowing to them. So these are only some uh, physical actions that are ways of showing respect. And it can be different as you indicated uh, in different cultures. Uh, a lot of the kids in the new generation, uh, they don't do that or it is not considered uh, as important by them or they do it but they don't really want to do it. Uh, which is again uh, from the point of view of uh, cultural transmission of values uh, quite problematic. And we talk in my class on uh, sociology of religion and culture about how religion reinforces important values in the family, uh, culture reinforces uh, important uh, values in the family, but also religion or culture can clash with uh, traditions in uh, the family. So <clears throat> uh, there are differences between Muslims on the practice of kissing the feet of your elder. Uh, this is still practiced in some societies. Uh, some Muslims accept it and do it. Some other Muslims think it is uh, improper and uh, too demeaning. Uh, but again, it's a contextual issue. What is wrong with it? If it is to indicate uh, respect and support for an elder, uh, if it is to indicate humility, then uh, that is positive. But if it is done to politicians, if it is done uh, not with good or true intentions, but rather uh, because a person is a hypocrite or a person uh, wants to impress uh, some rich uh, man or woman or uh, some uh, government official, uh, then in that case, uh, it can be considered unacceptable uh, and demeaning. Uh, and so, what is ideal, what is desired, is to have the religion and the culture reinforce the values that the family is trying to teach the children. And this also uh, shows up with greeting. Uh, as you were saying, the child should initiate the greeting. The child should say, Assalamu Alaikum, before the adult says, Assalamu Alaikum to them. The, sh the child should walk toward the adult uh, and acknowledge them and greet them rather than waiting for the adult uh, to come to them. Uh, in terms of service, uh, a child should bring water to their mother or father rather than expecting the mother or father uh, to bring uh, a drink or a glass of water uh, to them. So these kinds of uh, behavior patterns and habits are one of many indications of the kinds of values uh, that uh, are uh, an element in terms of child character uh, education. And when we talk about it in the book on parent-family relations, and we emphasize a lot that uh, ignoring or neglecting uh, these matters, which may to some parents seem like they are trivial or uh, they're not interested in them, uh, will uh, cause some issues and concerns uh, for the uh, cultural and moral uh, development of our children. Uh, uh, as we know, uh, the religion of Islam is very much focused on uh, values and morality. Uh, akhlaq uh, in Arabic are uh, values and mabadi are uh, principles. Uh, so, <coughs> Uh, the uh, the etiquette that a child must show is critical. Now, in some countries, uh, especially among the uh, more powerful, among the wealthy, there is a certain etiquette. Uh, Anes, you are uh, sharing with us. Uh, oh, the assignment. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, there's a certain etiquette. So when you are eating, uh, especially with rich people, 
or in a fancy restaurant, there is a plate, and then there is a spoon, a fork, a knife in a certain order, and then you are supposed to pick them up in a certain order, and you're supposed to cut your food in a certain way, and you're supposed to bring the food to your mouth in a certain way, uh, and you should close your mouth when you're eating, uh, and you shouldn't talk while you are uh, eating or chewing your food. So all of this is a part of something called etiquette, uh, eating etiquette, for example, or dining etiquette, or entertaining etiquette if you have guests at your house or you are a guest at another person's house. So this is among Muslims and non-Muslims, uh, part and parcel of proper social behavior, of civilized behavior. This notion of proper etiquette needs to be continued from one generation to another and shouldn't be limited to just practices that are done when you are with uh, high level uh, and powerful people or famous people or rich people. It should be uh, a set of values and etiquettes that are shown throughout a person's life and taught to them from when uh, we are children. Now, uh, if we talk about uh, the, uh, priority, the, the priorities for our children, these also have to be very clear. So a Muslim family may tell their child and teach their child and emphasize to their child uh, that first and foremost, the priority is the relationship with the Creator, a relationship of love uh, and respect and uh, worship to the Creator. And in turn, the Creator reciprocates by loving the creation. So we are the creation, we love the Creator, and then the Creator loves us. And based upon this relationship of love, we engage in a variety of activities that fall into uh, various moral categories, uh, various uh, types of uh, values, uh, a certain type of character. So, for example, we love our parents as part of fulfilling uh, the the the, uh, the teaching of our Creator that we need to and we should and we must love our parents and respect uh, our parents. If our relationship with our parents becomes purely materialistic, uh, like uh, it was pointed out in this discussion about materialism, then there is a breakdown. Then it becomes transactional. Then it becomes, well, if my parents give me money, then I give them uh, love and support. This type of relationship is sociologically very problematic. It is not sustainable. It is not a good foundation for any civilization, whether it is Islamic civilization or other. The relationship between children and parents, if we are saying it should be based on love, and this love should be without limits and should be based upon the highest form of love, which is love for the Creator, uh, then it can uh, sustain itself and uh, be continuous it becomes part of our conscience and it becomes part of our own level of character and values uh, and uh, morality. So love for parents, which then entails respect for the parents, which then entails humility and proper uh, behavior toward the parents as a foundation when it is based upon uh, a loving relationship with the Creator. If it becomes, like I said, transactional, economic, money-based, then there are so many reasons for it uh, to break apart. And that's why you see a breakdown in some societies uh, where children uh, are given the sense or are told, okay, we the parents paid for you all these years, uh, and then now you go on your own and you pay for your own expenses, and then uh, you pay for your kids, uh, and uh, there's... Uh, no obligation uh, beyond a certain age uh, and uh, beyond uh, a certain uh, social level. So you see in some societies, the parents can be very rich and the children very poor, and that's considered fine. Or the children are very rich and the parents are very poor, 
and that's considered fine. The children don't have to give anything to the parents. They have no responsibility to the parents. They don't owe anything to the parents. Uh, they don't feel, feel guilty uh, about not supporting uh, their parents. Whereas other societies, and we are, uh, this is being advocated as an Islamic <coughs> value, that uh, parents uh, have obligations to their children until they mature. Uh, but throughout the lives of the parents and the children, there is reciprocity. Uh, if any side needs help or support, there is a sense of obligation and commitment regardless of age. And particularly that commitment is true from the children to the parents. Now, some were mentioning about how parents, rather than living with their children, end up being put in a nursing home or a senior citizen center. Uh, which has become uh, normal, common, uh, the, uh, the thing to do in many developed societies. And there's a lot of discussion about this. Is it uh, something that is uh, truly a sign of respect and love and support, putting your parents in a nursing home or in a senior citizen's uh, living arrangement, or some alternative like living together with your parents or nearby your parents uh, and many muslims and this is what we advocate in our uh, parenting book as much as possible when parents and children are together or living nearby and providing mutual support this is most advantageous to both parties especially when you start getting uh, grandchildren now of course there are cases where the parents become very ill they need nursing care, uh, they need uh, very uh, intensive health care, uh, and uh, certainly uh, the sons or the daughters, <coughs> unless the, that's their specialty, uh, nursing, uh, <coughs> can either provide and pay for a nurse to, to take care of their parents, or if that's not doable, then the parents, uh, the option would be to put them in a nursing facility, hopefully something close by, for medical needs. It shouldn't be a way to get rid of the parents or to uh, push away any responsibility uh, toward the parents. So this is a, a common uh, <clears throat> element in, in Muslim societies and many non-Muslim societies where the issue of respect is on uh, a higher priority or one of the highest priorities. Another issue of priorities has to do with <clears throat> whether the parents bring up their children uh, to be spoiled, which is too much uh, leniency, or to be very controlled and strict and harsh with the children, which is another extreme. Uh, and from the point of view of sociology, these extremes are both very problematic. Many parents think that the way to show love and concern and attention to the kids uh, is to uh, spoil them. Now, of course, they will not say that or admit that. They will say, yes, uh, I was deprived in my life. Uh, I didn't have so many uh, nice things. I will let my kids have it and uh, be happy and enjoy and have fun. Now, if this leads to spoiling of the child and the child becomes arrogant, rude, disrespectful, uncaring, uh, then uh, the disadvantages are more than any advantages you may have been trying to seek. Now, some parents go to the other extreme, as I said. They deprive their children. They restrict their children. Uh, they put too much limitations on their children. And a lot of times this happens uh, particularly with daughters more than sons. So a lot of times sons can get away with a lot of things. They can go play outside the house. They can have friends, male or female. Uh, they can go see movies in the theater. They can go to the mall. Whereas some Muslim families and some non-Muslim families are overly conservative. So they, especially toward the daughters, don't let the daughter leave the house. Don't let the daughter have friends of their choosing. Don't let the daughter uh, engage in any entertainment, especially uh, outside, particularly outside the house. And this, again, the disadvantages outweigh the advantages. At the end, whether too spoiled or too uh, harsh, what, what is commonly uh, the result is rebellion and rejection. 
uh, and uh, rather than love and commitment and appreciation for the parents, uh, what is commonly seen is uh, distrust, hatred, uh, dislike, and rejection of the parents, neither of which is good for the family and neither of which is good for society. If uh, you are uh, clear on these things and uh, are uh, uh, happy with uh, the points that are being made, we can also talk about something called hierarchy. What is hierarchy? Hierarchy means there are levels in a society or in a group. There are those who are higher and then middle and then lower. So you can have economic hierarchy, political hierarchy, social hierarchy. A lot of times people <clears throat> point to economic hierarchy where there's rich people, middle people, and poor people. Or political hierarchy where you have powerful of, uh, people, uh, high-level politicians, government officers, and then you have middle-level uh, people with power like uh, clerks or like uh, administrators, and then you have uh, the least powerful people like uh, uh, people who uh, are citizens uh, that uh, many times are deprived of their rights. Uh, by the way, we just uh, heard on the news about this horrible uh, situation in India, in Maripool, uh, where two Christian women uh, were uh, assaulted and stripped naked uh, and paraded in the street and attacked by uh, a large group of men. Uh, and uh, this became a uh, uh, quite a, a large uh, issue in India. The media didn't talk about it for a long time and then finally started talking about it, and the politicians ignored it uh, until it became a big issue. So uh, a lot of times uh, in a hierarchy, in a social hierarchy, men are put higher than women, and men are given a level of uh, allowance or freedom to engage in acts that are hurtful toward women, whereas women uh, in this hierarchical uh, situation are taught to uh, be obedient to men uh, and tar uh, taught to follow men and taught to defer to men uh, and taught to always show utmost respect to men, whether their father or their husband or their son or their brother or their uncle. And again, uh, culturally, uh, this is uh, very uh, much an issue uh, around the world. Uh, and it can become quite problematic, especially when women are taken advantage of. So when you look at the beginning of Islam, uh, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, we can say was very egalitarian when it came to men and women. In other words, uh, the Quran and the behavior of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, made it very clear that both men and women are equally responsible to the Creator, have the same relationship to the Creator, are loved in the same way, shape, or form by the Creator, and they have a, 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 a level of self-worth self uh, that is equal. Neither is worth more than the other. Both are priceless and valuable. All men and women are a great creation of God, are a miracle. Neither woman is higher or lower, and neither men are higher or lower. However, some societies, whether they are affected by uh, some old Catholic teachings or tribal teachings, have uh, adopted an idea that uh, women are not equal to men uh, in terms of value or worth uh, or <coughs> social <coughs> level. They are subservient they are beneath men they are and should be under the control of men in one way or another and this has justified abuse and mistreatment and denial of rights to women throughout history now nobody i mean uh, certainly one here is not advocating that women should dominate men and women should make men subservient, and women should uh, end up doing the same thing to men that men have been doing to women 
uh, in many societies. That is not the argument. The argument is from my point of view, and this is personal point of view, uh, and, and the scholars we are looking at, the prophet taught us men and women are equal in the eyes of God. Now, some Muslims, so-called scholars, sheikhs, whatever you want to call them, imams, mulvis, mullahs, will say, no, 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 men and women are not equal. Allah created them different. And many of you may have heard this argument. And the response, the one response to this argument is to say, you are confusing two different things. Obviously, men and women are physically different. Men can never bear children. Women cannot produce sperm. This is a biological, physical, medical difference. So yes, obviously, physically, men and women are different. But under the law, in terms of the relationship to the Creator, the teachings of the Qur'an, the example of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, men and women are always equal. Then some scholars will say, wait a minute, you are advocating feminism, you are advocating Western ideas, you are advocating uh, that women engage in rebellion and reject men. Those are all false <coughs> accusations and not based upon the argument that is being made, in my humble opinion. We're not saying feminism is right or wrong. Fem feminism is the idea that women should all have uh, their rights fully respected. What the issue here is, if there is a man and there is a woman, does Allah love men or women any differently? And the answer that is being put forth in this forum is, Allah loves both equally, not more, not less. The argument also that is being advocated here, or the point of view, is that under the law, in Islamic Sharia, ah, according to the rules of our Creator and the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad, legally, men and women are also equal. Now, some sheikhs or mullahs or uh, mulvis or, or, or scholars uh, might say, wait a minute, wait a minute, what do you mean men or women are equal under the law? Islamic law says uh, a man can divorce his wife just by saying, I divorce you three times. A woman cannot do that. And that's interesting because when you look at divorce laws, there are many uh, issues uh, that come up. And sometimes the implementation of uh, divorce decrees in many Muslim countries and non-Muslim countries shows favoritism toward men and not to women. But who said that this is what Islam is advocating? The society may be advocating this, but it is not always fair to say that this is what Islam is advocating. Why should a man have a legal capability to get rid of his wife and a woman cannot? Because in many Muslim societies, a man can legally destroy the marriage contract just by saying so. A woman has to go to a judge and then it is legally considered if approved by the judge, then it is uh, considered uh, the marriage contract is annulled or void. So here we have a problematic situation where legally men are given much more power and control than women. And that is true. In many countries, this is a reality under what they are calling Islamic law. But if you look at the Quran and if you look at the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad, this was never a part of Islamic law. This came later. And this was, in my opinion, a distortion of Islamic law. Men and women should have the same legal basis for ending a marriage contract that is based upon a decision and a process that the Quran specifies and that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, has shown us, whereby both parties are engaged in uh, a legal dispute because in Islam, the marriage contract is a legal document. It is not just a social thing. Social part is very important. 
but it is also a legal thing, meaning the wife who's going to be a wife and the husband who's going to be a husband sign a document with witnesses. At least this is the way it's supposed to be done. Many Muslim families might not do it. It doesn't mean that's the right way. The right way, according to many legal scholars and the reading of the Quran and the understanding of the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, that uh, I am uh, expressing here, it's a legal document. And as a legal document, there can be terms specified in the document. And if both parties agree to the terms, then it becomes legally binding. So one of the most common terms is what in Arabic is called muqaddam and mu'akhar, the dowry. How much money is given by the husband to the wife uh, before the marriage and how much money is given by the husband to the wife if the marriage is uh, uh, has ended. And this is specified or needs to be specified in the marriage document and it has to be the agreement of the two parties. Now, in many cases, the wife is not consulted. Uh, her dad makes all the decisions on her behalf uh, or her uncle or somebody else. And she is completely clueless, has no idea what her dowry is. Uh, or even if she does, she might not be given the dowry. Uh, and if the marriage is ended, she might not receive uh, the, uh, the other part of the dowry. But these are violations of uh, Islamic law, not implementations of Islamic law according uh, to what uh, I am uh, sharing with you here. So <clears throat> either the husband or the wife or both can state in the marriage contract. For example, my sister said in the marriage contract that uh, her husband has to uh, provide her with transportation no matter where they live in the world to her and her children to go visit my parents at his expense. And he agreed. And this is a perfectly valid uh, item to include in the marriage contract. And if the husband violates that <clears throat> element of the marriage contract, she can take him to court and make him pay if he refuses. Now, let's say uh, there is uh, a situation where the marriage is no longer sustainable and one or both parties want to end the marriage. It shouldn't be just the husband's right to end the marriage because it is his right, but it should also be the wife's right to end the, the, the marriage because that's her right. She entered into a contract and he entered into a contract. And according to the terms of the contract, either party can exit the contract. In Islam, divorce is halal, not haram. Divorce is allowed. Unlike the Catholic Church, where divorce is haram it's not allowed legally in europe for hundreds of years it was illegal to get a divorce but what the muslim faith did is it put certain <coughs> rules around the word divorce and one of them is that before the divorce uh, there should be arbitration okay and uh, the, uh, the Muslim sources are very clear on this. Uh, and uh, so uh, when we are told, حَكَمٌ مِنْ أَهْلِهِ وَحَكَمٌ مِنْ أَهْلِهَا In the case where uh, there is the possibility of the marriage ending, the arbitration uh, required by Islam is that she assigns a representative and he assigns a representative. And these representatives get together and try to find a solution or solutions to the issue. One from her family and one from his family. At least one from her family and at least one from his family. This is a requirement in Islamic law, in Sharia. Now, many families do not implement this or ignore this or don't know about this. It doesn't change the fact. It is clearly stated in the uh, Islamic sources through the Quran and Sunnah. Then, if the party still cannot maintain the marriage, despite all the efforts to reconcile and to arbitrate, then it goes to court. Now, in order for the divorce to be legal, 
there is a court situation whereby both parties come to an agreement to end the marriage. Now, if they are both in agreement, then they sign a piece of paper that says, we both agree to end the marriage according to the following terms. If there is a disagreement, which happens a lot, for example, if the wife wants to divorce, but the husband doesn't want to divorce, or the husband wants a divorce, but the wife doesn't, then this is what we're co we call a legal dispute. Just like any contract you make with any business or with any, excuse me, uh, trade venture, okay? You can have a partnership, you can have a company, you can have uh, employer employees. There's contract and there can be a dispute about the contract. When there is a dispute, you go to court if you cannot resolve it through arbitration and through uh, peaceful means. So if you go to court and there's a dispute, then you can have legal representatives or you make a claim. So the wife can say, I want to end this marriage for the following reasons. The husband can say, I want to end the marriage for the following reasons. Or she can say, I don't want the marriage to end. Or he can say, I don't want the marriage to end. Whatever, they make uh, uh, their case in front of the court. And then the court has to adjudicate, to find a way to uh, address the legal uh, dispute the legal disagreement between the two parties and usually the disagreement is about money about children uh, and uh, about uh, <clears throat> any uh, future obligations so the wife might say i want to have the kids the husband might say no i want to have the kids the wife might say i want to keep the house the husband might say i want to keep the house right there could be disputes about property and money and things like houses and cars and uh, uh, land and uh, if they have uh, companies or uh, stock. So these are physical, material, uh, monetary things. And then there are disputes about social things like the children. If they cannot agree, then they go to court and the court has to decide. But both have equal power in the court. The problem is what? Many courts in the Muslim world, but also in the non-Muslim court, a lot of times automatically favor the man, favor the husband. So automatically, in most cases, they will say, oh, give the children to the husband. We don't care what she says. Children go to the husband. So here is a problem in the implementation and understanding of Islamic law. Many courts claim, so-called Sharia courts, they're called uh, in some countries, that automatically or even if they don't say it, what they do is they automatically just give the kids to the dad, to the father. And here is when there is a disagreement between the culture and the religion. Islam says they are both equal and have equal rights. The courts uh, behave otherwise, give more preference to the father than the mother. In many uh, developed countries like the United States, it's the opposite. There's more preference given to the mom rather than to the dad with regard to what's called child custody. So like something like 90% of the courts uh, or the cases, the children uh, are assigned to the mother rather than the father. And so there's a big father's movement in the United States and other countries where they're saying, uh, we love our children just as much as our uh, ex-wives love the children. We want to have access to the children. Uh, and, and so they're advocating with the courts that you should be more fair, uh, something like joint custody uh, or uh, some kind of arrangement where the kids are not exclusively only with one party or the other, only with the mom or only with the dad. Add this to the fact that in the e egalitarian nature of Islam that I am presenting here and that is being uh, discussed on the table <laughs> is uh, the same thing goes for uh, political issues. Any ruling by any government should apply the same to men and women equally. So whether it is you know having a car, driving, uh, flying, uh, rights as a passenger, <clears throat> ownership, uh, entering into agreements, right? All of these things. There's an egalitarian perspective and there's an inegalitarian perspective. So it used to be, in, or even the case until now, in some Muslim countries, 
or some Muslim societies, men were allowed to travel anywhere they wanted to, whenever they decided to, and they didn't need permission from anybody. Whereas women were told, no, no, no. If you want the passport, you have to have your husband's approval and consent. If you want to travel, you have to have your husband's approval, your husband's consent. So here we have inegalitarian. Husband can do whatever he wants, wife cannot. And this, for example, in Saudi Arabia until recently, whenever a, a woman needed to apply for a passport, she had to have documents, legal documents, uh, from her husband saying, I gave my wife permission to have a passport. And then if she wanted to travel, she has to have a letter from her husband saying, I allow my travel to tra my wife to travel without me. Uh, and without this letter, they won't sell her a ticket. They won't let her leave the country. That is inegalitarian. And it comes from certain cultural patterns, in my view, rather than uh, the religion, the faith, rather than Islamic morals and values. So when we are teaching our children, are we going to teach them egalitarianism or inequality, non-egalitarianism or anti-egalitarianism? Are we going to teach them that our sons or daughters, we love them both the same and just as much? Or are we going to teach them whether by words or by action that our sons are more important than our daughters? Our daughters should serve our sons. Whatever the son wants, the daughter should provide, not the opposite. Because this is what actually happens in many families, including uh, my uh, relatives and my uh, uh, <coughs> Uh, neighbors and, and the people from Mosul, the, the city in Iraq where my parents came from, this is how they bring up their children. The girls have to serve the boys. The daughters have to serve the sons. So the mom serves the dad, and then the daughters serve the mom and dad, and they serve the brothers. My parents grew up like this. Many, many people in Iraq grew up like this. This is inegalitarian. Where does this come from? It is not coming from Islam. They say that this is part of the Islamic tradition, but when you look at the Islamic tradition, that's not true. Both sons and daughters have to serve the parents, both parents serve each other, and both sons and daughters serve each other. Nobody has a hierarchy. Nobody should have a hierarchy. There should be no hierarchy of the wife over the husband or the husband over the wife. Now, if you look at Islamic history, sometimes this has been implemented, sometimes not. And until today, you will find, and I'm sure you have met them, many imams and scholars and mullahs and so-called sheikhs who will say, no, 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 men are above women. And this is from the Quran and the Sunnah. And you say, excuse me, but where where does it say in the, in, in the Quran? They say, aha, it says it very clearly. Ar-rijalu qawwamuna ala nisa and you say, what is this verse saying? They say, men are above women. Now, if you know Arabic, it is clear that they are lying or they misunderstand the verse. Arrijalu qawwamuna ala nisa does not mean men are above women. It means men have responsibilities toward women. Husbands have responsibilities toward wives. Males have responsibilities toward females. It's not a superiority. It is not a level of being higher. It is a responsibility. Two very different things. So they misinterpret the verse. They lie about what the Arabic words in the Quran mean. And they make it sound like Islam is supporting hierarchy of men above women when Islam, when the Quran is not. At least, again, this is my own personal opinion and understanding of the Quran. So, Qiwama, they, uh, in my opinion, misinterpret it as superiority, when in fact, Qiwama, the Arabic concept, is responsibility. 
Now, what are husbands' responsibilities towards wives? What are husbands' responsibilities towards, uh, what are men's responsibility toward women? Uh, what are male responsibility toward female? We can talk about that and it can differ from one culture or society. That's fine, defining those responsibilities. But it is a responsibility. And so uh, in the West, they developed something called gentlemanly behavior, where men open the door for women. If they are at uh, a table uh, and the woman wants to leave, uh, the men get up out of respect for the women. Uh, it used to be that men wore hats. They would take their hat off uh, in front of a woman. All kinds of different social conventions that show respect of men toward women. If a woman needs help, the men uh, come and help her. It is their responsibility regardless of who the woman is. And in Islamic culture, responsibility of men toward women or husband towards wife include a lot of things such as providing uh, support and uh, health care and uh, uh, providing education and uh, taking care of uh, uh, the husband takes care of the wife if she gets uh, older or weaker or more senile or has uh, uh, some kind of uh, illness or disease helps her with uh, anything at home helps her with the children it's a helping relationship not a controlling relationship now, in many Muslim societies, due to their culture, like Arab culture, there is this controlling relationship of men over women. And they are Muslim, and they are practicing Muslim. But this is not from Islam. This is from their culture. And it actually violates Islam. Men don't control women in Islam. Women don't control men in Islam. Husbands are, uh, husband and wives, the parents, are responsible for their kids. And they need to address and control their children's behavior while they are children but they should never control boys more than girls they should never restrict girls more than boys this is not coming from islam both boys and girls uh, uh, <coughs> uh, daughters and sons need to be taught that they both have responsibilities and these responsibilities need to be fulfilled regardless of whether they are men or women so then where do the differences between men and women exist, if at all, in Islam? Very good question and very important for parents, especially those who are raising Muslim children. But any child in any religious faith or tradition uh, or culture or civilization needs to address this question. Where do the differences uh, come up? Well, <clears throat> then we go back to the biological differences. Women have babies. Men do not. So men have to be very careful and responsible, uh, whether as husbands or fathers or, or sons or, or brothers, to make sure that when women are in the situation of uh, pregnancy or birth or after birth, that, uh, sh uh, that, the, the <clears throat> that women are taken care of as much as possible and in the best possible way. This becomes a responsibility on the men toward the women. And even the decision to have children to become pregnant should be a joint decision. It should not be forced on the woman. It cannot be forced on a woman. It is illegal to force your wife to have a child. This is called rape in Muslim culture and non-Muslim culture. You cannot force your wife to have a child, even though you really want one. It is a joint decision in Islam. Anything forced in Islam is illegal, is haram, is not allowed. Now, of course, when children are young, obviously you force them into certain behaviors because of safety or because of uh, uh, their, uh, their immaturity. They're not at a level of maturity where they can understand the consequences of actions so you can uh, force them to stop doing something or to do something this is during uh, young childhood but by the time they're seven years old you should have already taught them what is right and wrong what is proper and improper what is uh, <clears throat> dangerous and what is safe that's a parental responsibility and so you have the period of pregnancy and childbirth and then you have uh, every uh, time during the month when a woman is uh, 
uh, uh, experiencing the uh, period during the month. This is also a period of uh, time where women may need uh, extra help and support. Not all women, but some women, and that's fine. This is, again, a responsibility of other men and women toward uh, a woman during her specific period of the month. And then, uh, <clears throat> other than that, there's no physical, biological basis for any type of inequality. And the, and the only thing that's really we could call unequal is the increased responsibility of men towards women, not the other way around. Now, some say, well, in Islamic tradition, a wife has to uh, listen to her husband in order to get into heaven. This is, again, a very common thing. And they, uh, they allegedly come up with hadith from the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, that a wife cannot enter into heaven unless she listens to her husband. Uh, 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 a, a daughter cannot get into heaven unless she listens to her dad uh, and these kinds of things. This is just not true. This is not part of Islamic tradition, and there's a lot of made-up hadith about this. A woman enters into heaven by pleasing the Creator. A man enters into heaven by pleasing the Creator, not by pleasing another human being. Pleasing another human being is not the basis for heaven or hell. Everybody obviously should respect everybody's rights, yes. And uh, violating another person's rights, whether male or female, gets you sins which can lead you to uh, hell doing good things can get you uh, good deeds which can lead you to heaven but it's not based upon male or female man or woman it's just based upon being a good human being following the rules that the creator has put in the universe for us for humanity so this notion that somehow the way to get to heaven is a wife has to serve her husband has to listen to everything the husband says, has to be uh, <coughs> a, uh, a kind of doll or tool in her husband's hands. Not Islamic. Cultural, yes, in some cultures, but not Islamic. Even though it is reinforced by some so-called sheikhs or mullahs or, or scholars or religious figures. So if a religious figure were to say uh, that... Uh, Oh, Dr. Omar, oh, you people, you're advocating rebellion of women against men, or you're advocating uh, deviance, or you're advocating women to become sexually immoral or uh, out of control or chaos. These kind of responses are not based upon facts. They are not based upon proper reading of Islamic sources. They are not based upon history. They're just accusations. Why should a woman and a man, husband and wife, fully respecting each other, be an issue or a problem? Why would any sheikh or mullah uh, think that we are saying something horrible or terrible or wrong? The reason actually is sociological and economic and political. Men who want to be dominant and controlling try to find those who are weaker so that they could dominate them and control them. This is true throughout human history. So the shaitan, the devil, Satan, wants to dominate and control you by suggesting that you do immoral things, improper things, deviant things, because that's a way of domination and control through suggestion. Men who feel they are weak, who have <clears throat> psychological issues, sociological issues, they will try to dominate those who they think are weaker or can be dominated. So what happens is, in what is uh, in anthropology they call patriarchal societies, men try to dominate over women for psychological and sociological reasons. They have issues. And to address those issues, they think the way to address those issues, of course, they're not doing this consciously in most cases, is to dominate. And who to dominate? They, the culture creates an environment where women are told, you have to serve men. So when women are brought up this way, and men are told you have to be strong, 
you have to be in control you have to show your honor and your dignity and you are the protector uh, and you are uh, the real force and the power so then sociologically anthropologically <clears throat> you get a situation where women are trained to be the weaker part of a relationship with men who are trained to be the stronger part of a relationship purely sociological economic and political not from the islamic sources at all now why would men want to feel that they have to dominate and control and to be powerful and in turn society would train women to serve as the weaker and subservient role this is a very fascinating uh, psychological and uh, sociological question many societies feel the need to dominate women because of fear many men not all men but many men they will never admit this of course are afraid of women they have fear now why would men be afraid of women because a lot of times women have shown more intelligence and more maturity and more ability than men and this according to some men or the reaction of some men is a cause for fear <clears throat> they're taught or they get the idea from one or more sources that women are uh, more stupid or more weak or more incapable or <clears throat> more uh, backward and yet when they see a woman who is smarter than them achieving more than them better than them stronger than them then uh, they are scared it's a natural human instinct to to be scared of an entity that is stronger and more powerful than you that's why <clears throat> you know human beings are instinctually uh, for example, afraid of wa many wild animals because that animal can hurt you. So there's an instinct, a response against entities, uh, live things, uh, creatures that are more powerful than you. So for some men, this uh, gets uh, uh, part of their psyche, part of their uh, <clears throat> uh, mental uh, construction is that somehow women are supposed to be weaker so when they show strength then they see that as a threat or a challenge now why would men want to make sure that they dominate women uh, and they be stronger than women part of it is a survival instinct the societies when humanity first started out and for thousands of years uh, there were a lot of causes of death babies died uh, men and women died so society had to keep replenishing otherwise it died out so you had to get more babies more people more members of society well how do you get babies men can't produce babies women produce babies so you had to get women as soon as possible and as constantly as possible to produce babies and more babies and then even more babies now how do you convince a woman to go through one of the most painful experiences in her life as you know i mean the women uh, in this class know uh and i think men uh, all of you men realize giving birth to a child is extremely painful and strenuous maybe there may be exceptions but it's nothing that a man has ever experienced it's a wonderful it's a miracle it's a magical experience but giving birth to the child is probably one of the most painful experience that any human being can ever have. How do you get a woman to keep doing that? From as soon as she become able to uh, have children, uh, as soon as she reaches puberty, which can become be at 13, 14, or even so sooner, up until she can she can no longer have babies, which is uh depending on the uh, medical uh, obstetrical and gynecological studies you know can be up to age 
45, 50, maybe 55, okay? So let's say from 15 to 55, how many years is that? 15 to 55. 40 years, right? How do you convince a woman for 40 years to keep having babies? One after the other, after the other, after the other, after the other. And not just have babies, but take care of the babies. So that involves breastfeeding, it involves infant care, it involves all kinds of uh, staying up late at night uh, when the baby is crying, feeding it every time it wants to be fed, cleaning it, weaning it off of the breast milk. I mean, th these are big, huge responsibilities over and above the pregnancy itself, the nine months of pregnancy, which is difficult, which involves all kinds of hormonal changes, which involves uh, carrying uh, sometimes twins, triplets, even more, a heavy load. The woman's body is affected. Uh, it goes through all kinds of uh, transformations, many of which can be traumatic, uh, mood swings, right? Women know this, men don't have no idea about this or only the few men who have studied it or care enough about it. So for 40 years, she is going through all this massive pain and commitment and sacrifice of her own life and her own body because while well, a lot of women die in childbirth, right? For 40 years, 30 to 40 years, continuously. Most women will probably say, excuse me, <laughs> after X amount of children, enough is enough. But in order for society to replenish itself, this baby production has to be done. So women in many societies, at least in the far uh, uh, history of humanity, had to be turn, uh, turned for uh, survival reasons into baby producing machines against their will because nobody would want to do this voluntarily. So the idea was developed that men are more important, uh, more uh, are, are, are the uh, controllers, are the entities and societies that women have to listen to and follow and respect. Otherwise, she is told that there is disaster, chaos, destruction. She is the reason for uh, the death of all of humanity. Okay, a lot of ideologies are put into the brains of women. And so this develops into patriarchy, into men controlling women, and then men deciding all the decisions or most of the major decisions. And so uh, humanity is no longer in need of uh, baby production, uh, although some societies still consider it essential. But the notion that men control men, women continues. And women buy into that because that is what they are taught by their mothers and aunts and uh, cousins uh, and those around them and neighbors and uh, politicians and uh, everybody was telling them the same message you, you should listen to your husband you should let men control you and if you don't uh, then you are deviant and then uh, the Muslim so-called Muslim scholars use the verse in the Quran about nushuz wa in khiftum min hunna nushuzan if you fear it's translated as, if you fear disagreement from women, then you have to punish them. When in fact, nishuz does not mean disagreement. If a husband says, I want you to clean the house, and the wife says, I'm going to hire a maid to clean the house, this is not what the Quran is talking about, nishuz, about disagreement. The word doesn't even mean disagreement. What the Qur'an is talking about, and this is, applies for both men and women, by the way, in the Qur'an, Nushuz is <coughs> engaging in that which destroys the family relationship. So if she goes and flirts with men, or the husband goes and flirts with other women, this is destructive of the marriage relationship. So if a woman puts on a lot of makeup and perfume uh, and goes into the mall, she's going to attract attention. And if that's what she's aiming for, He's going to attract attention from men, obviously. So this is a category of nishuz, where she is undermining the marital relationship. And if a man 
puts on cologne and makes himself look nice uh, and goes to the gym and shows off in front of the women in the gym or the women in the mall. So he's committing the shoes. Or if he flirts with the flight attendant or he, he flirts, you know, engages in emotional, uh, romantic type of talk with his students uh, in college, his female students. There's all kinds of contexts uh, for the shoes, for undermining the marital relationship. But they, the, the male scholars, some of them, interpret this verse as saying, you see, women are required to listen to men. Because the verse is saying, uh, if you have the shoes, then you are wrong. That's not what Nishuz means, like I said. And it applies to both men and women, like I said. So ultimately, it's our job as parents to decide. Are we going to teach different things to our sons and daughters, and why? Or are we going to teach the full set of values and character traits and morality to both our sons and daughters, equally with full respect to their to the miracle of their creation by our creator and are we going to teach them to respect each other equally and for all men and women in society men and women in society to respect each other equally and to look out for each other equally is this is this what we will teach our children or not this is our decision this is our responsibility uh, this is what we will be held accountable for on the day of judgment. Allah is going to ask us, did you tell your son and did you tell your daughter that they are equally valued by the creator? Or did you tell your daughter that she is worthless unless she is a toy or a, a, a plaything or a uh, an entity under the full control of other men? What are you going to teach your daughter? And what are you going to teach your son? That he can go and do anything he wants with any woman he wants, more or less? Or are we going to teach him respect for all women inside the family and outside the family and that we are all equal in the sight of God and that we are all equally punishable for the same offenses in the sight of God? May Allah bless you. Thank you so much uh, for joining us today. Uh, I look forward to the second half of our course. Uh, and I want you to think about what we talked about today. Uh, and in the next class, uh, I would like you to share uh, what you uh, didn't like in terms of what you said, what you like, what you think I said wrong, uh, what you think I was uh, maybe correct about. I admit that uh, I am a human being. I make mistakes. A lot of what I say can be incorrect. A lot of what I say can be correct. And I look forward to you uh, responding to what anything uh, is discussed uh, in this class uh, and indicating uh, whether it conforms to your understanding or does not conform and clashes. Uh, and we can talk about it in a very open uh, and respectful way. Uh, I am not uh, giving any judgment about any opinion. We are here to hear everybody's opinion and there's no right or wrong opinion as far as the rules of this class are concerned what is advocating in this class is sharing and being honest and we want to hear from you everything and we can agree or disagree with each other this is part of the human process this is part of civilization this is part of our understanding of uh, the uh, islamic teachings and the way that families ought to be raised is children as they mature should be in in our opinion uh given and encouraged to share their opinions freely and honestly with their parents regardless of how much there is agreement or disagreement uh within the family about uh these opinions without resorting to shouting or uh, uh opinionating or uh Accuse accusations of entering heaven or hell. Those are discussions left for elsewhere. May Allah bless you. Uh, may Allah bless your families. I hope all of you had a great Muslim New Year last week. And inshallah, there will be uh, Ashura uh, on uh, July 28th. Uh, and so we hope everybody will have a great Ashura and Tasu'a holiday, which we can talk about also 
in the next class. Thank you very much. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Walaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Walaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Zabakullahu khairan. The lecture was interesting.